Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Julia He, a research scientist at the Ohio State University. TOPS is organized by Si Shang at the Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, Jamie Harmon Boyce at University of Massachusetts Amherst, and Mike Pesco at University of Missouri. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and the discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from those questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on top on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreci appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS web website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Si Shang, from the Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Today, we continue our winter spring 2024 season with a single paper presentation by Jamie Harmon Boyce entitled Electronic Cigarettes and Subsequent Cigarette Smoking in Young People, Methodological Considerations and Results from a Cochrane Review. This presentation was selected with a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Jamie is an assistant professor in health promotion and policy at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, USA, and holds an honorary appointment as associate professor at the Nuffield Department of Primary Care Health Sciences, University of Oxford, England, where she worked for many years before moving to the States this past summer. Her research mainly consists of applied evidence synthesis in areas including tobacco control, diet, physical activity, and long-term conditions. She is a Cochrane editor and member of the Cochrane Tobacco Addiction Group. Dr. Michael Pesco from the University of Missouri is a co-author of the studies and will answer select questions in the Q&A. Our discussion today is Dr. Kenneth Michael Cummings, a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Medical University of South Carolina and a member of the Hollings Cancer Center's Cancer and Control Program, where he co-leads the Tobacco Control Research Program. Dr. Jamie Harmon Boyce, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for being here. I'm just gonna share my screen. Lovely. So today I'm here to talk to you about a program of work that we're still um, in the midst of wrapping up, looking at electronic cigarettes and subsequent cigarette smoking in young people, and particularly uh, the methodological considerations and results from our forthcoming Cochrane Review. So the research that I'm presenting today was funded by Cancer Research UK. Outside of the current work, I've received grant funding from the organizations listed there. I've never received any funding from tobacco, vaping, or pharmaceutical industries, and don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. The most important thing I want to acknowledge, though, is our team. So this was a massive undertaking, as anyone who's read or written a Cochrane Review knows. It takes a lot of people to get one of these out the door. And so the lead researchers on this review were Rachna Begg and Monsur Akande, both at the University of Oxford. Also at Oxford, we had Jonathan Livingston Banks, Nicola Linson, Sufen Zhu, and Tom Fanshaw helping us out with this review. At University College London, also in the UK, we had Dylan Neal, Leon Shahab, Sarah Jackson, and Demetra Kale. At Harvard, we had Nancy Rigotti. And at Missouri, we have Mike Pesco, who we're really happy to have answering some questions today. We also had some support from some freelancers, and I mainly want to acknowledge here before I move on, we had members of the public who helped input on our review questions and how we went about answering them and sharing our results. And this was a particularly complicated review, and we're really grateful to their time on it. So just to give a little background, there are a bunch of competing hypotheses in this space about whether or not e-cigarettes, especially those with nicotine, might cause more young people to start smoking than would have otherwise. 
Observational data really consistently show that young people who use e-cigarettes are more likely to go on to smoke than their peers who don't use e-cigarettes. But what's contested is whether or not that is a causal relationship. So it's been hypothesized that vaping could be a gateway into smoking, by which we mean kids who wouldn't have smoked otherwise start smoking because they started vaping nicotine. It's also been hypothesized that it could be a diversion from smoking. So kids who might have otherwise started smoking, maybe never start smoking because they start vaping instead. And that it could be an off ramp from smoking so that young people who smoke could switch to vaping and therefore no longer smoke. Some people describe these as competing hypotheses in the literature, but at an individual level, of course, they could all hold true. It could be that for some people, vaping's a gateway. For others, it's a diversion. For others, it's an off ramp. But within public health, what we're really interested in the, is the net impact. So what happens overall at the population level? This is really critical because if overall vaping or the availability of e-cigarettes is contributing to more people starting to smoke than would have otherwise, then the net public health of vaping is absolutely going to be a negative one. As well as thinking about the net public health effect, we also are or should be interested in whether or not these patterns and transitions between vaping and smoking differ based on socially stratifying characteristics. And we might want to be particularly interested in those where we know there are big divides in smoking rates. Smoking rates differ massively within and across populations. It's a leading driver of health inequalities. And we know that net effects can sometimes mask important differences. So our program of work here actually consists of three components. The first two of those are really research products. So one is an evidence and gap map. That is mapping the available evidence on a set of domains, and I'll show you that in, in a slide or two from now. And it's currently under peer review. The idea of it is that it's available as an HTML file. Eventually, we hope it'll be published online, and it's something that users can interact with to find the studies that are most relevant to the populations or the questions they might be asking. The bulk of our work was really focused on this Cochrane review, which set out to the, assess the evidence on the relationship between the use and availability of e-cigarettes and subsequent cigarette smoking in young people, which we define pretty broadly as anyone aged 29 and under, and whether that relationship differs by socioeconomic status, gender, or other demographic characteristics. Those two components, the evidence and gap map and the Cochrane review, have been submitted for publication. They are under peer review. They are very much subject to change. So they are confidential and not for wider distribution at this point. And we'd ask that people don't take photos or share any of this on social media simply because it very well might change. Now, the third component of it is a recommendations consensus exercise to guide further research in this area. Even going into this Cochrane review, we were pretty sure that we weren't going to come out with really firm conclusions or answers. And so we wanted to make sure that at the start, we planned something that would really help us shape further research in this space. And this is going to be uh, popping up at various points throughout the presentation today, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through our evidence and gap map and our Cochrane review. And throughout that, where recommendations have come out from those results I'll, presenting, I'll be presenting, I'll tell you what those recommendations are. And we would love your input on this. If you are uh, listening to this talk, it's because you have some interest uh, in this space, and therefore we'd really love to hear from you. So we have an online survey up, which has each of these recommendations in there and also open-ended space if you want to add further recommendations. And I'd really encourage you to please do so. You know, you can pop into it during this talk. You can pop into it after the talk. And I'll make sure that this QR code and this link are up when I'm talking about those recommendations, just so you have some context of where these are coming from. So this is a very hard to read screenshot of our evidence and gap map. As I mentioned, this is interactive. And the idea behind an evidence and gap map is that you are mapping the available literature across domains. And we did this through a exercise involving stakeholders where we agreed what the most relevant domains would be. And this included policymakers, academics, and members of the public, as well as funders. And just to zoom in here, um, that's what that looks like. So what you see here along the left-hand side is we've classed studies in terms of exposures. At the top, we've classed them in terms of outcomes. There are also various filters that you can put on to select, let's say, only those studies in North America or only those studies which report differences by gender or whatever it might be. 
The size of the circle represents the amount of literature available. So that big orange circle means there's a bunch of individual level studies in that space. The colors correspond. And if you were using an HTML copy of this, you could hover on these and click and it would give you a list of those studies that would then hyperlink through to those articles. And if anyone's interested in seeing a draft of this evidence and gap map in its HTML form, they're very welcome to follow up with me via email. We're really happy to share it. Uh, though, as I mentioned, it is under review at the moment. When we look at the geographic and economic distribution of our studies in this map, it is very, very heavily weighted towards North America, particularly the US, Canada, and also the United Kingdom, with very few studies conducted elsewhere. Um, and so this is something we need to be aware of moving forward when we think about the results of this review, because they are definitely biased towards certain contexts. And we know that vaping and smoking transitions might be different depending on where in the world young people are based. We identified some evidence gaps just through this mapping process. These included a lack of evidence on geographic restrictions on e-cigarettes and the associations between those and combustible tobacco use outcomes. Uh, a gap around e-cigarette use and its association with population rates of initiation and cessation of combustible tobacco use, and gaps around associations between e-cigarette use and availability and subsequent tobacco use based on various socially stratifying characteristics. Through the systematic reviews we identified in the evidence and gap map, we found nine that met our inclusion criteria so that we're looking at the same question we were looking at. Three of those nine were judged to be of higher quality. All of them really consistently reported that young people who vape were more likely to go on to smoke, which is exactly what we expected. And all of them had listed in their limitations that because of the study designs and the limits of the ways of collecting this data, none were able to establish causality. And so coming out of our evidence and gap map, we made some recommendations around examining and reporting possible causes of differences in vaping and smoking transitions, including sociodemographic characteristics and contextual factors, a big call for data outside of the USA, Canada, and the UK, and a call to examine associations between e-cigarette use and availability and smoking cessation in young people. There was really very little on that. So moving on to the methods for our Cochrane review, we searched for evidence up to April 2023. We also issued a call uh, for evidence to our networks because it's really difficult to find gray literature in this space. These are not clinical trials. They're not registered on clinicaltrials.gov. The primary outcome we were interested in was the association between e-cigarette use availability and change in the population rate of combustible tobacco use in young people assessed through the re proportion reporting current cigarette use. And our secondary outcomes were associations between e-cigarette use and availability and those behaviors that feed into overall tobacco use prevalence. So incidence, progression, and cessation of cigarette smoking. That picture there is of our protocol. So if anyone wants to access that, that is up and published and available and has been since 2022. But as I mentioned, the review itself is currently under review by Cochrane and very much subject to change. In terms of our inclusion criteria for this review, this is where it starts getting a little bit complicated and I'm afraid uh, it doesn't get much more simple from here on in. So as I mentioned, we were interested in studies, including people age 29 and younger. We went for this broad definition of young people because we did a little bit of scoping and there was variation in terms of what people described um, as young people in the literature. The exposure that we were interested was any type of e-cigarette use. And this could range from one-time experimentation all the way to regular use excluding exclusive cannabis vaping if that was reported. So if a study said it was only looking at cannabis vaping as the exposure, then we wouldn't have included that study. And we're also interested in various measures of e-cigarette availability, and that could be policies that affect e-cigarette availability. So for example, bans or them being introduced onto markets, um, pricing, and also any aggregate data on e-cigarette use in our population of interest. As I mentioned, our outcomes there, our main focus was on what was happening at the population level, that net overall effect on smoking rates. And our secondary outcomes were really focused on particularly uptake, progression, and quitting cigarette smoking. We 
from the start decided that we were going to group our studies into two particular groups of studies. And the first of those were population level studies, which for the most part might be described as repeated cross-sectional studies, but you come across a lot of issues trying to define study types in systematic reviews because different people will describe the exact same study using different terminology. So in order to be included in our review, this type of study needed to use repeated measures and evaluate e-cigarette use in young people or their availability in the same population. Our individual level studies, which would most commonly be referred to as cohort studies, longitudinal cohort studies, could only be included if they prospectively collected data on e-cigarettes and smoking behaviors from the same individuals at a minimum of two time points. And we put in the stipulation that they could only be included if they considered at least one covariate related to propensity to smoke in their analysis. And this was to basically try and constrain the literature a little bit because we knew there were a lot of studies that met these criteria out there. We also had some conversations as an author team about whether or not we were going to put a cutoff on the number of participants in these studies. Um, again, to think about, okay, how much data are we gonna usefully get from a study that's published with 200 participants in it? We wanna find some way to prioritize including the bigger studies, but we're also nervous about just blanket excluding smaller studies with one of the reasons being that we were interested in whether or not there are differential effects in population groups. And we thought there could be some smaller studies that might yield useful data in that way, particularly getting into populations which are often underrepresented in research. So what we decided to do, and again, this was a priori before we started screening studies for inclusion, we're dividing our studies into two groups. So tier one studies, as we called them, were those individual level studies, these longitudinal cohorts that had more than 5,000 participants. And tier two were those with 5,000 or fewer. And the reason I'm pointing this out is that we focused on tier one studies and our population level studies in our analyses. Um, it happens that at no point were the tier two studies saying anything different from the tier one studies. But when it came to us conducting our analyses and doing our risk of bias assessments, those tier one studies were our focus within our individual level studies. The reason why these criteria are so complicated compared to a lot of the other Cochrane reviews I work on is that we can't include randomized controlled trials of this question because they do not, for the most part, exist. One might be able to feasibly imagine a randomized controlled trial in which young people, particularly over the age of 18, but under 29, who are already smoking might be randomized to an e-cigarette intervention to help them quit smoking. But that's not the main question of our review. And what is absolutely not going to happen is that anyone is going to randomize non-smoking young people to vaping. And for that reason, we have to look at different study designs and we have to be a little bit more specific about exactly what we're looking for. So coming from our inclusion criteria, one of our recommendations to help guide future research is just fitting into this thing that we use to narrow down our longitudinal cohort studies, which were about including data on propensity to smoke as a covariate. There were quite a few studies that we excluded because they hadn't identified that they'd used a covariate. One of the real struggles we had with this review was trying to figure out what we could do um, that Cochrane would be happy with to judge the risk of bias or critically appraise the studies we were including in our review. For anyone unfamiliar with Cochrane, Cochrane is a global nonprofit. It exists uh, not to make recommendations about what should be done in the space of healthcare, but instead its aim is to make sure that people who are making decisions what, that come to healthcare, whether they be patients or carers or clinicians or policymakers, are doing so with the best available evidence to hand. And Cochrane has a really strong focus on not only synthesizing the data and showing what the evidence finds, but also really exploring how much people can trust the data in front of them. And part of that is having quite rigorous and transparent processes and very specific tools that you have to use as a Cochrane reviewer. So many Cochrane methods are mandated, but traditionally Cochrane has been interested in reviews of healthcare interventions done using randomized controlled trial designs. And that is not what we were doing here with this review. And so we struggled to figure out what an appropriate tool might be to critically appraise these studies to judge how much we might be able to trust them. 
In the end, after a lot of consultation with Cochrane at the time, we use an adapted risk of bias instrument um, that's cited down here, which is designed to look at risk of bias in studies of exposures. Each study was assessed independently by two reviewers, and we assess studies on domains including potential bias due to confounding, participant selection, misclassification or deviation from the exposure, missing data, outcome measurement, and selective reporting. And for each of these domains, a study could be judged at critical, serious, moderate, or low risk of bias. And each of our studies got an overall rating based on that, which was basically the lowest rating that they got in any one domain became their overall rating. So if a study was at low risk of bias on everything except for one element at which it was critical risk of bias, we considered that study to be at critical risk of bias overall. And the thinking behind that is it only takes one thing to go wrong to bias the results of a study. And we focused our risk of bias assessments on those population level and tier one individual level studies. There's more detail on our risk of bias assessments um, at the end of this slide deck for anyone who wants to go into them and, and wants to ask me questions about them. We also made sure that we pre-registered all of this as we went through just because we didn't have the Cochrane Handbook that we could kind of cite for the methods we were using here. For data synthesis, again, normally in Cochrane reviews, you might expect to see a meta-analysis, which is the statistical synthesis of results across studies. But we couldn't do that here. The studies were simply too different. It would have been combining apples with oranges. The studies differed in terms of their designs, the exposures, and their outcomes. So we followed Cochrane guidance on synthesis without meta-analysis, and we created what we call association direction plots uh, to summarize what each study found and to look at how they compared across the board. We also used a technique called qualitative comparative analysis. Um, this was hypothesis generating as opposed to hypothesis testing. I'm not going to focus on it too much in this presentation, but I'm happy to answer questions about it. And it's a method that's more traditionally used in the political sciences that aims to look at which conditions need to be present in order for a given outcome to occur. We assess certainty using grade, which is really common across Cochrane, lots of medical journals and lots of guideline developers. So with our risk of bias assessments, we're thinking, how much do we trust the results of an individual study? With grade, we're saying, how much do we trust this overall body of literature? And again, all of our analysis plans we pre-registered in advance. So for our association direction plots, we basically attempted wherever we could to categorize each of our included studies as having a direction of association. And we classify these as direct associations or inverse associations. And at a very simple level, what we mean by direct associations are that essentially as vaping in young people goes up, so too does smoking, or as vaping in young people goes down, so too does smoking. And uh, in a simply put way, this would be really consistent with, for example, a gateway hypothesis. If what we were seeing was a direct association, then it would suggest to us that yes, it is possible that vaping could be causing more people to go on to smoke. On the other hand, we also classify studies as showing inverse associations. So what this would mean was that as vaping was going up, smoking was going down, or that as vaping was going down, smoking was going up, and, and that might be consistent with a diversion or off-ramp hypothesis, right? Uh, but that is, completely simple um, to be a little bit more complicated about it, but still grossly uh, oversimplify it. The reality of these studies that might look at direct associations is that we're fortunate enough that in many areas of the world and particularly in the areas of the world where we have data on this question, youth smoking rates are going down. They've been going down for a long time before e-cigarettes are around. And so we also classified studies as showing direct associations if they showed that when e-cigarettes were introduced, let's say that rate of decline slowed. So even if smoking rates continued to go down, if they were going down at a slower rate than we would have expected, then we might still think that vaping might be causally related to causing more people to start smoking. Similarly, an inverse relationship could look like vaping going down, uh, sorry, smoking going down at a population level, and then with the introduction of e-cigarettes, it going down even more steeply. So I am gonna pause before I get into our results and how we categorize these studies um, to take any questions uh, from you all. <laughs> 
Thank you, Jamie. So let's turn to our discussion, Dr. Cummings, to, uh, first to see whether he has any comments and questions. Thank you. Well, this is uh, <clears throat> an unbelievable task uh, on a very important topic. So kudos to you to taking it on and your in your team. Uh, and <clears throat> and as I read the hundred and sixty seven page. Uh, document, it was uh, a little overwhelming, but I had a few questions and I see there are quite a few coming in from uh, from our audience as well. So I'll be brief. The key question is, do e-cigarettes help or hinder uh, reductions in cigarette smoking among young people in this study? And just as a point of suggestion for your review, uh, I would uh, ask that early on you explain why assessing causality is important to that question. Because sometimes I hear people say, it's just the association that makes a difference. And that's all we really need to know, uh, rather than the causal uh, relationship. And maybe you could comment on why dissecting that is important now. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we really, when we're deciding about um, how to, for example, regulate e-cigarettes, it's really important to know if they are causing any changes in youth smoking, right? That, that's pretty critical. And we know that all sorts of things cause changes in youth smoking behaviors and prevalence. That can include the COVID pandemic. It can include mental health. It can include tobacco industry interference, all different sorts of things. And so if we're just looking at associations and not looking at one cause, if one causes the other, then we risk being in a situation where we might make regulatory decisions on e-cigarettes that are assuming uh, that they will have a certain effect and maybe won't because actually what we're seeing isn't causal. Right. Okay. And I would just encourage you to get that right up front and make it clear to readers as to why they need to dig down on that. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of variables, but the, you know, you have a primary outcome, which is focused on the, just the, you know, the relationship between e-cigarette use and then subsequent smoking uh, behavior. Uh, and But then it gets complicated. You've got ever, uh, current, past 30 day, regular use, daily use. I did not see purchasing of a product and wondered whether that would be something to consider adding in the future, because I think that is correlated with maybe more regular use. I would assume there's more noise in an association, you know, that's less weekly uh, related, like ever use uh, is sort of a very broad measure. It brings in a lot of people, but uh, the associations may not hold up across studies. So the consistency there. Uh, so is it possible to get a table that, you know, simply uh, summarizes some of that information in your review and the definitions, because I found it a little bit hard to follow. Uh, just And then you get into secondary outcomes, which make it even more complicated, initiation, progression, and, and cessation being the other ones. Yeah, that's very possible. Um, the other thing that actually is that table is the evidence and gap map in some ways as well, but that's kind of okay. separate to the review and not yet available online. But yeah, that's a great suggestion. Okay. Why don't we get to some questions through lots of them up here. Somebody had asked, uh, you know, uh, the majority of North American, uh, you know, studies are in North American UK, which languages other than English did you use in your search? Oh, so we in Cochrane have to include all languages. Um, so that in itself hopefully isn't ruling things out, although you can never guarantee it because you don't know how well non-English language is being indexed on various databases. Uh, but I think the bigger thing that was contributing to the fact that most of our cities were coming from North America is that a lot of our cities were based on um, surveys that were already existing and collecting data on this uh, and the infrastructure that was there in those spaces. All right. And you've got two types of studies, ecological and individual level studies. And they are often at odds, it, it appeared. Uh, mm -hmm. I won't, you know, tip the hat, but mm -hmm. you're going to go there eventually. Um, you know, ecological studies uh, are just what they are. I mean, they're really looking at time points. Was there a minimum number of time points that you had to have in those studies where you were comparing uh, trends over time? Yeah, so we, for those, we also had two time points. Um, 
they weren't always comparing trends over time. That was an important point to make here. So some of them were comparing trends over time, but a lot of them were also using, um, particularly those that were looking at things like availability, uh, like states as comparators, right? So if one state introduced restrictions or didn't introduce restrictions, another state did, then sometimes we'd have these quasi-experimental studies that fell into that category as well. Okay. And, you know, I'm um, getting uh, more questions here. I'll try to get to them here. Did you uh, test for nonlinear changes in smoking rates over time? Well, that's something we'd want our individual studies uh, to look at. And one of our recommendations is about that. Yeah. Okay, great. That's good uh, response there. Um, what else did I have here? Real quick. Um, individual level studies. Uh, the length of follow-up as a moderator or mediator of the effects, I would assume, you know, because if you have uh, sort of a longer time period, people get older, and we know that uh, smoking rates go up as people get older. So how do you take account of uh, the length of follow-up? Uh, because even, you know, the longer it goes, a distant, any use of an e-cigarette seems, you know, not likely to be a driver of somebody actually smoking maybe, you know, five years later? It's a really good question. So we, as a default, always prefer longer term outcomes in our studies. And that's what we did here. And we'd actually intended to split our association direction plots by length of follow up. Um, but very few of them followed up for or very few of them had the data that we were using that was at less than six months. Only one or two of them did, and we flagged those where that was the case. So if some of us are reading this review and seeing that studies that we thought were going to be there aren't, uh, what what does that mean about the selection process and so on? Uh, what that means is that you should email me in case we missed anything. Um, we always try our hardest not to, but you can never guarantee it, particularly with the way things are indexed. Um, but also there are a lot of things that came up through this that we were like, is that included? And then we'd look at it in more detail and realize it was missing an element. Um, and that's where those really kind of nitty gritty and complicated inclusion criteria come in. But yeah, if there are things you think should be there that aren't there, let us know. We certainly found one that was suggested to us that was obviously relevant, included all of our search terms and just wasn't returned by our searches okay. because it hadn't been indexed correctly by the humans doing that on that yep. data. One more good question. Again, people who follow this literature, like I suspect many of our audience, uh, we get studies that come out and then we get, you know, useful uh, post-publication debates going on, you know, letters to the editor. And how do you take account of that? Yeah, so in Cochrane, when we're screening for inclusion, we're screening at the study level as opposed to the publication level. So if there's post-publication debates that are going on, we're also bringing in those references in our review if we can find them. Um, and where those are introducing additional information or more data, we take that into account as well. Okay, great. That's the end of my questioning uh, at this stage. And <clears throat> I think most of us are anxious to have you move forward and tell us what you found. Lovely. All right, here we go. So we ended up with 123 included studies of those 24 were what we call population level studies covering, we think, approximately 4 million participants, though, as I will get on to explain in a bit more detail, it is very difficult to rule out overlap here. And 99 individual level studies of those 40 were in 5,000 or more participants. And so we classified those as tier one. And we think those covered around half a million participants, covering participants ranging from nine to 29 years in age. We had a lot of overrepresentation from specific surveys. No one, I think, will be surprised to hear that PATH contributed a huge amount of data to this review followed by the National Youth Tobacco Survey and other surveys in North America. And we struggled with how to do, deal with this. If it was a meta-analysis, then we would not have double counted the same participants twice because that would be very bad practice. Uh, but we weren't doing meta-analyses. In our qualitative comparative analysis, we did um, narrow down which studies we were included to avoid overlap. But the, what we've done in our actual review is just highlight where the overlap exists. And it's something to be aware of as a considerable limitation. Uh, of the data in this area is that you can have a lot of studies that show the same thing, but if they're all using the same data, then it, it becomes difficult to know how generalizable that is to different data sets. 
In terms of our risk of bias assessments, this just shows us what the issues were um, with each domain. This is across the population level studies. What I want to draw your attention to both here and on the next slide is that the thing that things actually performed the worst on overall were what we call bias in selection of the reported results. So as you'll see there, only a few were low risk. The vast majority were considered at moderate risk. And when it came to our individual level studies, also in this bias in the selection of reported result, we see the vast majority at moderate risk and a couple at serious risk. And what that actually refers to is the fact that so few of these studies had published protocols or analysis plans in advance. And we don't want to go after individual authors on this. It's just, I think, simply that it is not common practice within this space. But it means we end up in a situation where all of the studies included in our review were considered at moderate risk of bias at best. So we didn't have any included at low risk. Um, I want to mention that because often then people are like, well, the tool's too awful. It's too hard. You know, no study could ever be at low risk of bias. But actually, studies could have been at low risk of bias here had they uh, hosted their analysis plans in advance. So big call to all of you to do that moving forwards. And if you do it, also cite it in your review so us reviewers and your papers so us reviewers can find it and mark you as low risk for that. So in terms of the critical appraisal tool and those issues we found, main recommendation there is just pre-registering your research in advance. I know it's not common practice here. And I know unlike clinical trials, there's not an infrastructure with which we can post those really easily. We'd suggest using something like open science framework moving forward. Also things around participant selection, um, reporting around anonymity of respondents, and clearly specifying the frequency of vaping and smoking, uh, whether used as exposure variables or outcome variables. A lot of times it wasn't clear how frequently someone needed to be vaping at the start of the study in order to be categorized as someone who was vaping. Around population level studies, we had some specific calls here to ensure parallel trends assumptions were met, um, comparing outcomes of interest across different jurisdictions and contexts. So this is going back to the conversation we just had, potentially investigating the possibility of dose response effects, because that can make us more confident if there's a causal uh, nature of our association, controlling for other policies and various other elements here, which I won't go into, but you can see in detail if you are kind enough to uh, respond to our survey. And for individual level studies, we want studies to control for combustible tobacco use at baseline, which seems obvious if that's what you're looking at for your outcome, uh, but wasn't always done. To report differences in missing data based on the exposure groups uh, and same goes for loss to follow up. So now moving on to our actual results and how we characterize them. So just as a reminder, what we did for each of these groups of studies within our outcomes was we looked at the direction of association, whether or not there was a direct or an indirect association between vaping and smoking. Two of us did this categorization independently. Um, and so starting off, when we looked at these population level studies that were looking at associations between e-cigarette availability and smoking prevalence, we found two showing a statistically significant direct association. Those are both at critical risk of bias, according to our criteria. And so those showed that as vaping went up, so too did smoking rates. A further two found a direct association that wasn't statistically significant. One found no evidence of an association. Three found a statistically significant inverse association. So as vaping was going up, smoking was going down. And I want to say that's 11. Yeah. Uh, found that as vaping was going up, smoking was going down, and that that association was statistically significant. So the majority of the studies that looked at this outcome, which was around our population prevalence of smoking, found an inverse association between vaping and smoking. And as you'll see, there are some patterns there in terms of risk of bias, where it looks like those studies which um, fared better using our risk of bias tool were more likely to find a statistically significant inverse association. And I want to be clear that we assessed our risk of bias before we went on to assess the results. So it wasn't that we were just saying, oh, because they found an inverse association, they're somehow ranking better on risk of bias. Those two things are completely separated. Only two studies looked at associations between population level e-cigarette use and smoking prevalence. 
one found no evidence of an association and one found a statistically significant inverse association, but with only two studies, there's not too much you can say there. And then we're gonna move on to our individual level studies, which are looking at those specific behaviors around smoking. Of our individual level studies, certainly the majority of them were looking at relationships between e-cigarette use and subsequent smoking initiation. So these were studies which recruited people who didn't smoke and then looked at associations with subsequent smoking based on vaping status at baseline. We actually split these into current and ever use studies. So we wanted to make sure that if there were differences, we might be relying a little bit more on the ones that were looking at current use um, at the time the study started, as opposed to picking up someone who might've vaped five years ago once at a party and never done so again. Here, the, the large majority of studies uh, found a statistically significant direct association. So in other words, kids who vaped were more likely to go on and smoke than those who didn't vape at baseline. And we saw a very similar pattern when we looked at associations between every cigarette use and smoking initiation. So it seemed like regardless of what measure you were using of vaping at baseline, kids who vaped were more likely to go on to smoke. Again, we have an issue here where all of our studies were judged to be at critical or serious risk of bias. This one no association study I just wanted to point out because they originally did find a statistically significant direct association between baseline ever e-cigarette use and smoking initiation, but they added in a variable which was controlling for general liability to use tobacco products that was above and beyond some of those other variables around propensity to smoke. And at that point, the association um, completely disappeared. When we look at associations between e-cigarette use and smoking progression, we only had five studies that looked at this. All of them found a direct association. Three of them were statistically significant, two were not statistically significant. And the pattern was the same whether or not uh, the baseline exposure was current or ever e-cigarette use. And we only found three studies which uh, could be characterized in terms of the associations between e-cigarette use and smoking cessation. Of those, one found a direct association, um, one found an inverse association, and one found a statistically significant inverse association. So these were very inconclusive and a little bit all over the map, quite frankly. Now, in terms of sociodemographic characteristics, this was a real disappointment for us because this is something we really wanted to dig into a little bit especially because we know that there are such variations in youth smoking uptake, um, really clear variations by socioeconomic status that aren't quite the same when it comes to patterns of vaping. And so we were curious about what would come out um, of these papers, but very few studies reported data on whether or not the associations they were looking at varied based on sociodemographic differences. Though there was no evidence of differences at the population level, the individual level studies which reported it suggested that vaping was more strongly associated with subsequent smoking in males than females. And there are like some plausible reasons why that might be the case. Uh, a lot of that data came from PATH, so we probably need to look at it in some other data sets, but it did seem an interesting difference there. Data were mixed regarding rurality, race, ethnicity, income, education, and age within our population of people 29 or younger. What we mean by mixed is some studies found one pattern and other studies found a completely different pattern. And so it is not clear whether or not there's some underlying truth there in terms of whether any particular characteristics make you more or less likely to go on to smoke if you're already vaping. There was no data available on other variables, including mental health status, LGBTQ plus status, occupation or religion. We'd really like to see those in the future. And seven out of the nine individual level studies, which examined associations based on measures related to the susceptibility to smoking, found that associations between vaping and subsequent smoking were higher in those with the lowest susceptibility at baseline. Uh, two studies found the opposite. No population level studies looked at this. But I think it's an interesting thing to keep an eye out for because 
I'm not quite sure why it's happening, but it seems like it's happening in enough studies that we should be paying attention to it. And it also seems troubling, right? The kids who really it seemed like they weren't susceptible to smoking seem to show the strongest association between vaping and subsequent smoking outcomes. So in terms of our recommendations that came out of these results, one of them was just about reporting guidelines and following those where they exist because the people extracting the data sometimes found it really hard to find the data that they needed. And when we went through and we assessed the certainty of the evidence using GRADE, I'll tell you what we found. I'll give you a little bit of background on GRADE for anyone who's unfamiliar with it. So the idea behind GRADE, as I explained, is that you're judging the certainty of a body of evidence overall. And that can range from very low to high certainty. And you are considering five domains basically, which would make you less certain in your outcomes. That includes risk of bias, unexplained inconsistency between results, often referred to as statistical heterogeneity, whether the evidence is indirect, whether the evidence is imprecise, and whether or not you think publication bias is likely to have occurred. If you're grading randomized controlled trial evidence, you start at a high certainty and then you downgrade if any of these come up as problems. If you are grading the certainty of observational evidence, grade guidelines stipulate that you start at low. So a lot of observational evidence never makes it above the low point. You can possibly upgrade observational evidence um, if there's evidence of a dose response effect. That's one of the things we said we'd quite like to see. Uh, or where all plausible unmeasured confounding would be in the opposite direction of the association detected. And those certainty levels at high, we mean that we're really confident in our estimate. We think it probably reflects the truth. We don't think new studies are going to come along and completely change our mind about it. And very low certainty means we're just very, very uncertain. We think new studies could come and really change our conclusions in this space. And I don't think you'll be too unsurprised to hear that we do not have uh, particularly high levels of certainty for the evidence base as it stands now, according to these criteria. So overall, when we looked at population rate of combusted tobacco use, we did say that there seemed to be an inverse association. So as e-cigarettes were becoming more available and more people were using them, smoking rates seemed to be going down. But this evidence was judged to be at very low certainty. It had issues with risk of bias and also with inconsistency, right? So not all studies found an inverse association. We similarly have very low certainty evidence here of direct associations from our individual level studies looking at these behaviors of smoking initiation and smoking progression. Again, here, uh, issues with risk of bias, all the studies contributing data here were judged to be at serious or critical risk. And for cessation, we also have very low certainty evidence and it's actually totally inconclusive. We didn't even feel like we could we could come up with an effect direction based on what we were seeing. And though we do have evidence that shows that e-cigarettes can help people quit smoking, um, that evidence is from adults, right? It, it tends to be from older people who are enrolled in these trials and we don't really know what's going on in cessation when it comes to people under the age of 29. And again, here we had issues with risk of bias and issues with inconsistency. And so we've called for further studies, ideally using triangulation methods um, across a wide range of study designs that could look at causal effects. Um, in order to support stronger causal inference, we have an issue here where we have two different studies designs which are showing two different things. And we argue that we absolutely need more consensus on how to best design these studies to evaluate causality. And then we need studies designed to follow those principles. So that's where the survey comes in. We clearly need more data on studies conducted outside of the USA, Canada, and the UK. We say this for everything because it's always true that we need uh, more data from other contexts, but I think it's particularly important here because regulations around both vaping and smoking vary massively between countries, rates of vaping and smoking vary massively between countries, and all of those things could really plausibly impact uh, relationships between vaping and subsequent smoking in young people. I think we really need more studies that are looking at socially stratifying characteristics and particularly those which tend to be associated with smoking outcomes. And finally, I just think we really need acknowledgement of uncertainty in this space. You know, 
I, I do our Cochrane review of randomized controlled trials of e-cigarettes for smoking cessation. We think that's high certainty evidence now. A lot of people tell us it's super uncertain evidence. That's fine. There, there are different viewpoints there. But what I struggle with is when people then say that there's certain evidence that vaping is causally increasing smoking rates in young people, according to the framework we set out, which, you know, we stand by, we think it's really still up in the air and that we need more studies to give us more information on that. So I'll stop there to give some time for questions. Um, and thank you. Thanks, <clears throat> Jamie. This is great uh, work. Um, I'm going to start out and I have a few questions in the box uh, that people have asked. So, uh, and I have these on my list as well. So I'll just read them to you here. Can you elaborate a little bit on the direct and inverse association, not statistically significant? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So this is, Cochrane doesn't like statistical significance as a concept because it argues it's arbitrary. And it is kind of arbitrary, but also it is kind of important and we don't have anything better than it as far as I can see. So Cochrane guidance is that when we're categorizing directions of associations or effects, we're not supposed to pay attention to whether or not it's statistically significant. I can't really live with that. Um, and every time we send things out to peer reviewers, they're like, we need to know if it's statistically significant. So that's why we have those two different categories. So we have those where the association is statistically significant, which typically means that the p-value is less than 0.05, um, or the confidence intervals exclude no difference. Uh, and then we have those where the point estimate itself might suggest that there's an association, but uh, the p-value or the confidence intervals are so wide that we wouldn't call that a statistically significant outcome. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, another question that probably a lot of people have is how are you going about synthesizing the sort of population or what I referred to earlier as ecological studies mm -hmm. and then the uh, observation individual level evidence, since they seem to be coming to slightly different, uh, either, I think you said direct or inverse, uh, I would use positive or negative, but <clears throat> whatever, uh, how do you how do you put those together? And should those, like Ghostbusters, the streams never cross, I know. Uh, because they are really different, although they remind me of like NRT, they work in randomized trials, but in population studies, we don't always see the effects. Yeah, it's a great question. And that positive and negative thing, just to say we did start off doing that, but then we ended up in this situation where we'd have a negative outcome, which was that fewer kids were smoking and then that felt wrong. So that's why we changed the language that we used. Um, I don't know, quite frankly, like statistically, we'd never combine those studies because they're just too different, right? Um, how do we make sense of them overall? I think there's not a clear answer on that. And it somewhat depends on why you're looking at the evidence. So if you're thinking about, you know, what's what's going to happen at a state level or at a national level, what, what's going on there, then I would argue that those studies which are looking at overall prevalence and particularly those ones which are using uh, more sophisticated quasi-experimental designs with control uh, that isn't just time, but it's also, you know, looking at different jurisdictions, might be more useful. But if you're looking at like, what kids do we need to intervene on? What kids do we need to focus in? Um, if we're thinking about vaping prevention and smoking prevention interventions, who, who do we need to focus on? Then I think there's a lot of space in those individual level studies to give us a lot of really important information as well. Okay. So a related question is, uh, how do you take account of an evolving marketplace where products are changing, events are changing COVID, obviously, being a big one that we can think of. But then there are policies like Tobacco 21 that came in in the US and, you know, flavor bans and product bans and all these kinds of things. Uh, I mean, the association could change in those population studies, mm -hmm. you know, smoking sort of evaporating among teens in the US. So uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be hard to have e-cigarettes cause smoking if nobody is smoking. Yes, yes. And this is a really good point. So from a methodological standpoint, there are things we can do, right? None of them, in my opinion, are totally perfect, but there are things we can do to control for those, right? Um, from a kind of uh, practical standpoint of being like, are we worried about young people starting to smoke? Yes, we should still be worried about that. We should be really happy that numbers are going down. But when it comes to tobacco control, I think we've always struggled with any sort of um, 
single thing, right? Whether it be taxes or standardized packaging or whatever it might be to say, this is the exact effect of this policy and to split it out from other things because we know human beings and their behavior is pretty complex. And in reality, a lot of the policies that we have in front of us are interacting in different ways. And, and within those policies, I would include policies around e-cigarettes as well. Okay. It's an unsatisfactory answer, but if I spoke with more certainty, I would be lying. All right. Well, you know, basically this, you know, this, you can't do a randomized trial of kids. Give me SIG, some don't get it, and then evaluate what you see at the other end. So we're going to be stuck. This is very similar to what happened when smoking came on the scene in the early part of the 20th century. It reminds me of the same kind of thing where we started to see death rates going up in parallel with cigarette use or consumption. And then, you know, more individual level studies. I'm curious, did you come across in your review anybody who's been doing like case control designs where you could look at people who, you know, down the line as adults or young adults now mm -hmm. are established cigarette smokers and go back and look historically at their past e-cigarette use? Yeah, so you definitely could do that. Um, as you say, one of the challenges is e-cigarettes um, not being necessarily on the market for that long in some of these spaces when these studies were done, also the change in technology. But what I would make a plea for, and if we can figure out how to do it, we have a study on this, it would be so amazing, is a technique called Mendelian randomization. And so what we have there is we are looking at basically some usually genetic component that might predispose someone to vape or not vape and be totally unrelated to things that might then uh, predispose them to smoke or not smoke. And a great example of this um, Mendelian randomization has been used in alcohol, where there's a gene that basically makes you alcohol intolerant. It just makes you feel gross and awful when you drink alcohol. And we can look at that to really tease out causal relationships between drinking and subsequent health outcomes, particularly at that like moderate alcohol consumption level. And so I know there are teams that are trying to figure out if they can find um, some sort of marker that they could use for Mendelian randomization to look at vaping and smoking. And if that is ever found, that would be a glorious outcome, I think. Well, there, there are a number of GWAS studies that I've seen on uh, nicotine use, uh, as well as uh, other drug use behaviors, and they seem to correlate. So that's a, that's a great idea. I'm not sure you know, I, I don't think, you know, the two groups necessarily overlap, but uh, they're obviously it fits in with your biological rationale as one of the factors you highlighted. So yeah, if we could find like a gene that made people allergic to vegetable glycerin, for example, uh, we could maybe do a very elegant study. All right. And I'm, you know, I'm getting a comment here. When you see the decrease in smoking levels in youth in New Zealand, when uh, the vape was suddenly allowed, but the level of smoking is already very low. How is it possible to compare it to a European country where young people are smoking much more, but can also decrease with vaping? And how can you compare those these different countries in your study? And I guess that you know begs the question, do you need to use a country as a stratifying or effect modifier variable? Because the environment, I would think, makes a big difference. Absolutely. And like one of the things we talked about if we were to do statistical analyses, which which we did judge as inappropriate, was that one of the modifiers we'd absolutely want to look at is kind of baseline smoking rates in the youth populations in those countries. Okay. Um, and let's see, we've got another question here. Did you use causal inference statistical methods versus not as a quality criteria, if no, and why? Um, so we didn't call it that, but some of the things particularly around our population level studies were related to variables that you might want to see if you had a study which was trying to establish causal inference. But they're a little bit more like black and white nitty gritty things. It, it's a good question because it, it popped up on my radar and I wrote it down in advance here because I, I went back to Hill's uh, Bradford Hill's uh, criteria for judging a causal association. And while you have a qualitative you know, direct, uh, inverse, null. Uh, I mean, strength of association is important. And then looking at a dose response uh, relationship, have you, did you come across any studies there? Was there any way to look at that? We couldn't look at dose response um, and we'd really like to look at that. So that was what I touched on a little bit on that grade slide is some of grade, I think, has been very influenced by those Hill criteria, quite frankly, when it comes to the observational evidence. Okay. I think we're just about towards the end. So I will turn it over to 
uh, C and Mike, uh, I guess, whoever closes us out, which I'm not really sure, but fabulous presentation, a very tough project uh, study, and you're looking for input now. So many good questions came in. So please send the questions along to Jamie. And uh, thank you very much for presenting this uh, early preview of your study. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let's turn this to our MC today, Julia He, to take us out. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time. However, if you still have burning questions or thoughts for Jamie Harmon Boyce, you can join us for Top of the Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following select Tops events this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once this event uh, concludes. We will leave this webinar room open for an extra minute after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL, which is bit.ly slash tops meeting, all lowercase. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 244 people for your participation. Have a top-notch weekend. <laughs>